Wonderful. Wonderful. I think I figured it out. Uh, much fun? like you, the older I get, the less I know about technology. Oh, just terrifying. Like, Use this. Yeah. I don't want yeah. To even the link, even when you sent me the link, it's like, okay, send me the link, and I'm hoping it's a Zoom live, and I see StreamYard, and go StreamYard, and it just starts sweating straight away. Please work. Everything, please work. Same, oh, same. My. That's exactly yeah. how I felt. All right. Well, it looks like we've got a few people starting to trickle in here. Um, let me just make sure I got this all connected. I want all to right. say thank you, thank you for the treats. Did I not say thank you for the treats yet? Did I say thank you? You may yet? have. Yeah. Oh, I hope I did. I hope I emailed you back. Oh my God, I'm not doing this live on air. Thank you for the treat, posting them all the way from the US. I appreciate it. Dudley is a big fan. Oh, you gave me so much. He's only such a small dog. I know yeah. Thinking, yeah, so uh, he's plowing through it. So some hairy bits, which I needed. So I appreciate that. So very nice. And a treat of the month and that kind of stuff. Labeling, everything yeah. smells lovely. Great stuff. So I, I do appreciate that. That was great. My pleasure. And I know you've got a small dog, but a lot of people will use those as part of their meals. Totally, so totally. Nice. Yeah. yeah. People would ask that question about traveling all the time. They say, what do I give a dog with, with traveling? It's dried meat. I mean, it's such an easy dog, animal to feed. It never goes off. Dried meat just right. sits in your bag. You don't need to worry about complete for the week. I mean, you go on holidays and you're eating pizza and and, and cocktails. You know what I mean? It's hardly a complete right. diet you're having yourself. You know, it's a yep. complete yep. mess. You, re, you <laughs> rehab after your holiday. And it's the same as your dog. If he had those lovely, a box of those dried meat treats from real dog, I mean, that's the how lucky would he be? For that week thank so, you uh, thank you yeah. yeah we're going camping this weekend and i started thinking do i need to bring a cooler no actually i could just nah. bring meatballs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. water that's all you need you know yeah i'm Love excited you. for that all right i'm curious where everyone is joining in from we've got a big time zone difference here it's noon pacific time here in california oh, yeah. and uh 8 p.m your time 8 p.m here yep yeah, would love to know where you guys are joining in from. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Connor Brady, for joining me today. I've got my favorite book here, always at my desk, all tabbed up and highlighted. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> if uh, our audience hasn't heard yet of Dr. Connor, he has written Feeding Dogs, which we reference a lot in our upcoming uh raw nutrition course that we're coming out with. Uh, you're also with Dr. Nick Thompson and Brendan Clark at the Raw Pet Medics, which I yeah. love following you love guys. That. It's great fun. Yeah. Yes, um, especially your Patreon. That has been a great uh, resource for us as well. Ah, good. Yeah. Like, I think uh, I wasn't looking forward to that at the start because it's kind of another thing you have to do, you know, yourself as a, as a big business owner. But yeah, um, yeah but once you get into it and you start doing it religiously, it's like a little warm jacket and you tune in with the lads and it's it's good fun. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. going well. I didn't think we'd be going so long. Like we're a year and a half at it now. And I thought we'd yeah. run out of topics. I was saying once a month. But every week there's a list of topics that we need to hit. And sometimes you can just get on and bitch for an hour and it's great. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relief sometimes. Yeah. You know? So yeah, I love that. And I think the more uh, I've been doing this, the more I realize that I don't know anything. Totally, totally, <laughs> like totally. The, less I know, the more I learn, the less I know. Yeah, so that, that, that's a fact. I was telling you initially about this probiotic thing. We're going to be, we're going to be talking about it tonight. But even when you talk to some of the professors that know about skin flora and skin flora and gut flora, definitely, definitely mm -hmm. related. You know, similar critters, but some live on the outside with air and others live on the inside. And I asked this professor, 30 years lecturing on, on skin flora, uh, a question about good for him. She goes, oh, no, that's not my field. And I'm like, it's not your field. It's the same thing. And she said, no, yeah. I studied the, I studied the desert. And that's a, that's the sea. That's, the, that's like studying mm -hmm. the sea. It's completely different. It's a jungle to a sea. Even from your hairline down to your lips, it's a completely different environment. You know, and I thought, she, that's, how, that's how tight you can get into a subject. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's all connected. In fact, I'm doing a live next week with a scout who uses pre and probiotics uh, topically on the skin Ooh, cool. oh cool yeah cool like yeah it? yeah there's a cook there's yeah. a few companies doing that um uh topical um uh, this skin flora lady touched upon it that they have now got it down to species level so people say lactobacillus and bifido but she says lactobacillus like they're the two species we talk about all the time they're in most that's most of our probiotics for humans and dogs because they're air breathing probiotics so it's hard to make a probiotic from the anaerobic bacteria in a dog's stomach. So this lactobacillus, but she goes, no, it gets down to the species and subspecies because some of them yeah. upregulate itch and some of them downregulate itch. So now we can take that. Yeah. 
And I was like, so she, she won't even, she goes, oh, broad spectrum probiotics are like broad spectrum antibiotics. And uh, oh. she goes, I want it. I want a surgical tool if there's an issue. So this guy's producing ear sprays, skin sprays, and mm -hmm. down to the species level. So initially I thought it was all the same stuff in a different bottle, but no, no, it's, it's, anyway, there's another reason. Like, you know, when you think you know something and then you talk to somebody that's doing something like that, you realize, oh my God, I better talk about yeah. probiotics yeah. as little as possible. Yes. Mm. Which is exactly why I wanted to bring you on live because we've been talking about gut health and behavior and mood and how that affects. We get a lot of people that come to us whose dogs have allergies and that will trickle into sort of crankiness for lack of a better word. And I know this is something that you specialize in. I'm hoping you can sort of start from ground zero for us. I know you started out um, after you finished school, did your doctorate, you went out to Australia and you were working with dogs out there, the, the guide dog training. And that yeah. is that what sort of sparks the gut health interest? Yeah, um, I think I, my doctor was studying the effects of nutrition on behavior and gut morphology. I used deer as my test subject and then you extrapolate it out and we're trying to figure out why group living animals move certain ways. And so guts and behavior and food, they're the three things combined. So they're the sort of things like, you know, poo. Um, you come out thinking poo is just really, really interesting. And when everybody was feeling dry and there was nobody feeling raw, you were a bit of a freak. But then yep. as more and more people move to real food and they start talking about poo and sending pictures, some lady was saying there recently, she goes, I hope nobody ever finds my phone because there's just loads and loads of poo pics on it. They're going to think I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ever had a dog with recurring good issues and half the people that jump to your food and real food in, in, in as a whole you a lot of them come with good issues um and skin issues so the um that that's that that at its heart is is uh is is what i, I have i get the most buzz from because like it's 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 the same things so recurring skin issues recurring good issues i always look at that as a as a house on fire and i just say let's get the gut sorted out and we'll see what's what's left but um, yeah, yeah a good issue was, was the thing when I hit Australia and then you meet some really big vets that were already pushing the raw message, Bill and Hurst and Lonsdale, two big top raw feeding vets, both Aussies. So I got chatting to them and and then uh, Brisbane guide dogs changed 200 dry fed dogs to raw food and their veterinary bills fell by 82 percent. And wow. that's not a figure I use lightly. That was in the Brisbane Courier Times. You can find it online. 82% it fell. Now, therefore, the top things were current skin and gut conditions um, and orthopedic issues. But it was when their trainers started saying, and the difference in the dogs, the trainability, the focus. Yeah, the focus. Kennels were, yeah, kennels were quiet. And it all makes perfect sense. You've gone from having a, 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 an ultra-processed food substrate, which at the time, even then, I was talking and doing seminars that you know probably wasn't enough. You need to add some things. But suddenly a rush of all these bioactive compounds and B complex and good quality fats, good quality protein, all the things we know that if you have a lack of it, it can cause you problems. Mm -hmm. Cut out the chemicals, chemical preservatives, you know, all the stuff. Kids after a birthday party, nobody wants that. So <laughs> these dogs were suddenly better able for their training. And I was like yeah. blown away by these results and the figures and the vet bills. And I run back to my superiors for the guide dog school I was working for in Australia. And they're like, yeah, no. And I was like, what do you mean, no? Look look how healthy these, look at the difference in these dogs. And they're saying, yeah, no, the vets don't, uh, the, 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 the vets aren't backing it. And I was like, oh, I was so annoyed. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'll show you. So 10 years later, I am. Um, I, yeah. I yeah. What can you do? Yeah, wonderful. No, and it's unfortunate because I, I see a lot of people still running into issues with their vet and even just broaching the conversation. Nobody wants to talk about it, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But let's 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 mm. start at ground zero. Can you sort of walk us through gut flora anatomically? Like, what is it, and how does it work for our dogs? Okay, so you hear if you start with the human side of things, like you hear this figure of one and a half kilos of of gut flora you carry around all the time. It's one and a half kilos of bacteria. So you are ten times more bacteria than you are human cells, uh, mm -hmm. and so. You are, if you think about it, when you really start getting into good flora, you start thinking about the human body as a bit of a vessel for carrying these things around. And these guys, it's not just like bacteria, it's it's also virus, yeast, protozoan, fungi. There's all sorts of stuff going on in that jungle in there. But it's all controlled at a top level by your main dominant bacterial groups, okay, in whatever quantity they are happy to exist together in. And they keep you their host happy okay so they engineer everything they survey the food they fix your intestines uh, they signal when there's trouble if there's something they didn't like 
um, they control everything and they control a lot of behavior. 90% of your serotonin comes from your gut. It's actually this thing around the gut called the GALT, G-A-L-T, the gut mm -hmm. associated lymphoid tissue. It's the new organ they found 10 years ago, a big hullabaloo about it. Uh, but it turns out this, that's like a new brain and it's all around the gut. And the gut flora talk to the GALT and they send signals up to the brain via the vagus nerve and that's how the whole thing runs so if you're being a good boy and you're feeding them the right food they say tell the brain to release some serotonin and you get a little chemical hit oh lovely i just had a salad and uh they're happy okay so that's that's the good for in a nutshell they can control everything um they can even make you anxious they can make you um irritable to make you hungry um pathogenic bacteria if you don't look after the gut flora okay and it shifts into the wrong thing let's say like it's called dysbiosis so let's say you have a good infection or you take antibiotics or you're eating chemically preserved dry food and chlorinated mm -hmm. water every day or you're crazy stressed you've grown up in a terrible home you know you see the same black dog behind the gate and he attacked you when you were young and so you bark at the black dog and not the ginger dog over here but the white dog bites you on the bum so walks the same walk every day so this sort of stuff can get stressful in the dog's head and you do the same thing every day so all sorts of things can affect the gut flora and yank it out of position. And when that happens, you no longer get the good moods and the good behavior and the, the gut protection that they give you. They fight diseases and they keep other bacteria in use. You never, you don't get that stuff. And that's the route to disease. If you don't keep the gut flora happy, you don't get the good stuff that they give you. They digest all your food. They give you like so many of your vitamins and minerals and, you know, you couldn't digest your food without them. So, it's a it's a symbiotic relationship. You got to keep those guys happy, and that's what that's what it's about. So now we look at the gut flora as a little garden that we've got to nurture. So we now we mm -hmm. look at a chemically preserved pig's ear that doesn't go off in a sweaty prospect box in a pet shop. It's been sitting there for six months. It's come in a cargo ship and it doesn't rot. It's a piece of meat. And now mm -hmm. you look at that and go, Do I want to give that to my dog? You know, especially if he's got recurring gut issues. Definitely not. You want to yeah. so. That, that's it in a nutshell, looking after your little gut garden. They're your buddies. They're not to be feared. It's positive stuff. And looking right. after them, you get good health. You don't look after them, you're going to get bad health and behavior. And so you're talking about keeping that gut flora balanced. And I think that's yeah. the terminology that most people are familiar with are the probiotics. Some people know about prebiotics. Everybody has heard of antibiotics at this yeah. point that gut flora. And I really like that you're making some parallels between human health, human gut health and our dog's gut health. Cause again, no one's talking about that in the, in the human health industry either. Yeah. 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 It's, it's so, kind of like, yeah. So go ahead. What, what food, I think this is the million dollar question. What is the optimum diet that we're looking at to keep our dog's gut health in good tact? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of chat online about like, you know, ancestral and paleo. And we have to come up with these terms because our diet today, human diets and pet diets for sure, has shifted from normal real food ingredients to crazy packet food. And now mm -hmm. more than 50 percent of our of our shopping trolley is processed, ultra processed food, food like products, food stuffs, but not actual foods. Mm -hmm. And for the for cats and dogs, it's 100 percent kibble or canned ultra processed um, muck with a with 100 ingredients in it. And that can play havoc because your normal gut flora that reside in these intestines, especially shaped to house them in a dog, they have a different digestive system, they have a different gut flora to us, kind of, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they house different things because they eat a meat diet largely. So most of the gut flora in their diet would be looking for a meaty dinner. Um, but you can shift those colonies. So let's say in our case, we should be eating, we all know what we should be eating, lots of fruit and veg and whole grains and, you know, a bit of dairy, a bit of meat, maybe whatever, whatever's your bag. Uh, we know we should be eating that. And when we do, we're very, very healthy. But we can eat terrible food, loads of corn and, and fried pork and crap that we know is digestively not good for us. And your gut flora will change, but that's not going to bring health to you. That is adapting. And what you're getting there is the, is the bacteria that doesn't really care about its environment poos all over the place, causes a bit of inflammation, you're getting an ear inflamed bell, doesn't give you the happy head compounds and all that kind of stuff. So um, so for a dog, for humans, we know what we're supposed to be. For dogs, it's, it's up in the air and there's a big debate over what dogs should uh, or have eaten in the past. And 
you can look at diet studies. That's what the first part of the book is about. But to cut a very long story short, when you look at the biology of the dog, the physiology, his evolution, and most mm-hmm. importantly, the diet studies of truly feral dogs, the dogs that never grew up with humans, because humans put funny things into them when they're pups, and then the pups grow up eating that stuff, like a cat eating broccoli on YouTube. Yeah. And we think that's normal. It's totally abnormal for a cat to eat yeah. broccoli. It's a total meat eater. And yet here he is eating broccoli. And a and a person can kind of say, my cat loves being a vegetarian. And I'll say, well, he's used to being a vegetarian. That says nothing about his health. And then you get into a whole other debate. And this is from a vegetarian guy, so I'm not just slagging them off. But, you know, this is not a vegetarian animal. Get a vegetarian animal if that's what you're after. For a dog, yeah. there's a little bit of a door open because they do include a very small amount of vegetation when left to their own devices. And so some people can say, well, if he eats a tiny bit of blueberries for the medicinal kick, why don't we give him 60, 70 percent corn every day? It's like, that's the ridiculous mental leap people have made. But to right. suggest that his gut flora is happy to jump from a meat and bone and organ diet, a whole prey, dogs eat rats and li- lizards, frogs, mice, birds, fish. They'll eat anything with a face given the mm-hmm. chance they are. Op- <laughs> like they're just pure opportunistic predators so uh they lead anything uh, great for carcass so their whole face is a nose really so they they'll outcompete vultures to carcass vultures won't live near them uh they leave poo they leave pretty much anything uh but not a whole lot of plant matter you wouldn't see a dog attacking a wheat field or eating a whole lot of carrots if they were there maybe the slugs off the carrots mm-hmm. um, so yeah so if i was if you're going against my head what would dogs eat that's the sort of diet they need and if you want as good for it to be happiest that's the sort of stuff i'd be feeding to them and i'd be feeding it fresh because that's how the dogs eat it they eat it fresh uh and it's okay you give them a bit of cooked meat now and again you give them some treats you give them well, that's fine we all do that as long as the mainstay of the diet is in good uh, is good then the good for will be very happy and very tolerant of the odd hiccup you know we sit in friday night and we eat some chips it's okay you know not the dog but like uh <laughs> we all do it. Your, body, your body forgives you and look i'm no pure if i'm eating a bit of ice cream listen i have happily let the dog lick the ice cream tub now and again this is not good food for dogs but i'm talking about it if you as long as 98 percent of what you're doing for that dog is perfect i mean how lucky is he that's about yeah. as good as he yeah can. agreed and by the way guys we are going to have a q a uh in the second half of our hour live today uh, i have so many questions but what i what i think you're saying is dogs cats all of our domesticated friends are resilient and they adapt to whatever it is they we feed them because that's what they have yeah. to do to survive um, and that's what I think a lot of confusion lies because we'll hear people, you know, I'm a fresh food proponent. I feed raw. Most people on our team also feed raw is, you know, it's working for my dog. Why should I make a change? And mm. there is some truth to that if it's if it's working, if you don't see any problems. But what are the kinds of things that we do see as a result of poor gut health or dysbiosis, the imbalance? Yeah. So like if you think good, good. Good bacteria, you know, they digest all your food. So if you don't look after your gut flora, you won't get good digestion. So mm-hmm. a dog with terrible IBD, his digestion's gone to gone to muck. And you'll see he won't be able to put weight on this dog and he's losing form and he's getting a bit lean because he's just pooing out all his nutrients. And so you feed him more food, but it just shoots straight through him because the machinery is not there. The gut flora has gone to pot. And uh, so you won't digest his food. They fight cancer. They're, they're involved in every single disease you can possibly name and um, your mood. So I've just talked about serotonin, which is released by your own body. That's the good flora saying release some serotonin. But the good flora themselves produce GABA and butyrates and all sorts of things. Dopamine, uh, loads of things come from your gut. That, so all these happy head compounds. So again, if you've got a pathogenic bacteria going, if you've, if you've skewed your gut flora and suddenly this strange new one is growing, you're not getting any of those happy head compounds. They don't look after the intestinal lining. And mm-hmm. if you if you persist and have this a pathogenic bacteria doesn't give you any good things and his byproducts are toxic. So it, it just it, it, it harms the interior of the gut. Lots of inflammation. You're not digesting your food. You're getting weaker and your gut starts to rot. So this IBD disease kicks in. And you get a bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, they call it. And you, mm-hmm. you, now you're on a hamster wheel because you keep on feeding the problem food. You keep on feeding chemically preserved food. Then you hit it with the occasional antibiotics, which is napalm for the good floor. Last wipes. thing they bloody need it. Yeah. And not even all of it. Just wipes some of the weak ones out. It doesn't get all of them. They live in tiny, tiny little crevices. That stuff doesn't touch them. So, um, so you end up just making it worse and worse. So a lot of dogs on the conventional veterinary route 
are on this chemically preserved food and then they're on magic GI food, which is about as different from the normal food as hair and fur. It's the exact same stuff, but they're on then monthly doses of drugs to control the symptoms of what is an unhappy gut and gut flora. And and that's the true, that's the new medical way of treating things. So they it's like fire people looking at a house on fire and they're seeing itch and a recurring ear infection and all sorts of things in the dog popping up as a result of how his guts are on fire. It's like fire yeah. people saying, oh, geez, look how we stop all this smoke. I know, we'll tape up the windows and we'll put a carpet over the chimney. And then, oh, look, there we go. It doesn't look like yeah. the house is on fire at all. But it right. is. And then bigger and bigger issues start coming out. So you've got to get the holes into the fire first. So rectifying good issues. If it's recurring skin or gut conditions, same thing in my opinion. Recurring ear, skin or gut conditions, all related to an upset gut. Uh, for whatever reason, usually ultra processed food, but any sort of things can do it. You get an operation, you take too much antibiotics, you get a belt of giardia, and you take loads of antibiotics, and you don't quite get over that because the vet never gives probiotics or fresh right. food with life. It's just fresh food and anti-life. So you're stuck in this little wheel, and then things start to decline, as I said. So uh, yeah. fixing, the good, fixing the good is key, and there's a certain process to that. Yeah, I think we've all seen those recurring ear infections, the itchy skin, the hot spots, uh, all too yeah. often. But on to positive behavior, I think we know what serotonin looks like for us and when we yeah. feel good. What does that look like in our dogs? Like, is that right after a good meal, they're in a good mood, wagging their tail, or is yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> I I think uh, I think the temptation is to think that. Uh, these chemicals are going to give us a bit of a, of a happy euphoric feeling. And I would say happiness is a bit of a social media concept. I think like happiness is the peak and, you know, terrible depression is the trough. And, you, <laughs> you know, and there's moments of happiness in your throughout your day. But to think that all oh, your whole day is going to be happy is just ridiculous. You couldn't possibly attain that. So I think evenness and just just being fine is about mm -hmm. the most you can hope for, for your dog. So all dogs get really excited to see, a you know, a sausage. Do you want some hot sausage? Oh, my God. And he starts getting really, really giddy. Uh, that's even that's just happy chemicals coming into him anyway, uh, just at the thought of the food. But, but the chemicals that are released, like serotonin, you don't actually get a real good hit of it. It's like when you eat a chocolate bar, you think the bar tastes nice. Uh, but what you're really getting is you've got a patty. People say I've got a sweet tooth. What you've got is a pathogenic bacteria. You've got an upset gut floor. And it's saying get sugar, get sugar, get sugar, get sugar. And you go out and eat a chocolate bar. And the chocolate tastes nice. So that's the first reward. But then you get a chemical hit that switches off the dysphoria that that good flora was giving you. So that good flora is, is engineering you like pulleys and it induces dysphoria through the chemical compounds it releases to make you give it the food it needs. It's the same with uh, diseases in babies. It's the same with alcoholism. Uh, it's a back in friend of 400 French people, big alcohol, big uh, drinkers. They gave them probiotics and decreased their drinking by like 60, 70 percent. It's a back what we think is a glass of wine that we need every night. It's a sugar hit and wine, beer. It's all sugar. So you can actually decrease your drinking just by taking probiotics. So um, so it's not it's not a massive like release of serotonin. You go, oh, yeah, man, that is amazing. You know, it's not a drug like that. It's a tiny little, it switches off the bit of unease that you had. You know, so you, you wake up, you've been to a party and you need some junk food. It's a bit of unease that's been induced to you because your guts are in bits. And the nasty bacteria that are there are saying, why don't you just go get a burger? And they're like, yeah, and you get a burger and you feed it and it switches off the need. It's like having a cigarette. You don't go, oh, you know. Well, some do, I suppose, but it's more it's more getting you back to normal is what yeah. you're looking for. And so yeah. it's a, it's a, they give you normality. Good for it, give you normalness. That's what you're yeah. looking for. Yeah, um, I can assure you that probably some people in our audience are not going to be happy about what you just said. I have <laughs> yeah. a nightly glass of wine and I'm like, wait, so wait. <laughs> me <too. laughs> yeah, me too. But I look at it, I look at the red wine and I think, do I like sweeter wines? Is that what is that my thing? Because I'm sweet. I just like sweet stuff. And when I get off sugary stuff, uh, you are getting off an addiction. And like I, I gave up, you know, I was I, on and off of vape for the last like five years and and, and back on it at the end of just before over Christmas time there. And it's like, geez, it doesn't help my wife go mad after hide it from her. So I said, oh, I'm going to give up drink and sweets and the vape on January 1st. And yeah. the, the vape I never went back on. That was just a temporary blip. Uh, and then I broke on the sugar on the very first day. The drink I could stay off for the month or two. I took the break from because of Christmas was hard Christmas. And uh, but sugar, the very first day I ate an entire like fudge bar 
uh, because I was just, you know, so it is a tough addiction, sugar, but that is a gut flora issue as well. Like it's a, it's an addiction that's hard to beat and you're chemically switched on. Um, but yeah, yeah anyway, but uh, yeah, so when you get the, get the right foods to the dog and it, it's really more about rectifying what's wrong. So if you are, if you presented me with a very stressed dog, the dog's come out a pound or he's been abused or whatever. Uh, I would say that before any training whatsoever is given to this dog, you bring him into a nice, happy, calm home and just, you know, give him a, that's, that's paramount. But after that, you've got to get the foundation right in the dog. You've got to get like those Brisbane guide dogs. You've got mm -hmm. to get everything topped up because nutritional studies for the large part, behavior and nutritional studies, the studies of nutrition, the effect of nutrition on behavior are usually a study of deficiency. So if we study the effect of omega-3 on American or Irish, because we both are deficient in omega-3, and compare them to Italians, and we say, what is the effect of omega-3 in Americans or, or Irish to Italians? And you'll see that omega-3 has a dramatic effect in our populations, but not on Italians. Why is that? Because Italians have more omega-3 in their diet. So is that amazing? About, is that, that omega-3 being amazing? Or is it a, a study of deficiency? It's a study of deficiency. Similarly in kids, and you're looking at the effect of Ritalin in kids, and isn't it effective for ADHD? Well, yeah, but so is B-complex and dark greens. Dark green smoothies are very effective for kids with ADHD. So is it B-complex deficiency uh, or not? So it, these questions are also tryptophan. People like to put in tryptophan into their supplements for behavior, add some mm -hmm. tryptophan. But the, all the studies of tryptophan in dogs are categorically negative. They have no effect. And the only one or two studies where tryptophan was of any benefit whatsoever was in very low protein foods. Mm -hmm. So people need to realize that the kibble they're feeding is low, low protein. It's the lowest amount of protein they can feed the dogs and get normal results over six months. Okay, 18% protein. It's the minimum amount of protein, not optimum. So if you're yeah. feeding the animal a minimum amount of protein, and some of those amino acids, methionine and, and tryptophan, all these other things, you need cartonine. You need lots of these things to keep a happy head going the precursors to tryptophan and serotonin and stuff. So um, if you give a dog a minimum amount of these, well then yeah, adding in some of those bits on top might be doing, might might help his head. But I would be saying, why won't you feed the dog the optimum amount of tryptophan every day? So sure. he'd have the optimum amount of serotonin. So what we have is, is that studies of dry fed dog show, you can add in pretty much anything onto dry food and the dog's benefit. But we don't have those studies of, of fresh food because fresh raw dog food gives the dog everything it needs. We don't talk about minimums. Who wants to give their kid the minimum of anything? I want right. the optimum. So a lot of the behavioral stuff, good quality vitamins already in real food, good quality minerals, zinc, iron, all play huge roles in your behavior. Zinc oxide, iron oxide in dry pet food can affect your behavior. High salt contents can do it. Poor quality protein, little of it. Good quality fats. Who would think that fat spread on the outside of a kibble six months ago, chemically preserved, is as good as this sardine from Real Dog? You know, this is this is kind of uh, where we're at. So a lot of it is a study of deficiency. A lot of the behavioral stuff we're still seeing in dogs is dogs fed the wrong food that is deficient in the good compounds. So why does raw work? We just attack everything. We just put it all in and it works because they're now getting everything. They're not just talking about tryptophan or fats or this vitamin. We're talking about it all at once, rushing onto the dog, and it is transformative to the point, and I'm racking on here, I'm sorry, but I'm on a run. Uh, there's a there's a very famous behaviorist called Turid Rugas. I don't know if she made it across the pond at all, mm -hmm. but she's huge here in Europe, and she wrote this book, Behavioral Signals, in the end. What was the name of I didn't catch it. Uh, she's Scandinavian, Turid Rugas, so T U R I D R U G A A S, and you see her YouTube videos. They're straight out of the seventies and early eighties. But in guide dogs, she was a god. She was one of the. First, she, she taught you all the behaviors that dogs do when they meet and they circle and they sniff the ground. Displacement activities, all this stuff was hers. Uh, calming signals, uh, what they do if they're a little bit apprehensive, licking of the lips, tucking the ears back, looking at you for support. These are things that guide dog owner trainers are looking for as you're putting the pressure on the dog and asking them questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need you, buddy, to decide whether I should cross this road because I'm going for it. And then the dog goes, oh, God. And if he's not enjoying it, if he looks like he's bottling a bit, well, then he, he can't do the training. So um, right. anyway, Kurt Rugas, huge trainer. She's about in her 70s now, I assume. And she's been training for 50 years, writes all these books. And she sent me an email. I got chatting to her in 2015, started doing some seminars for her up in, um, um, in Sweden. And uh, 
then uh, she sends me an email just recently, just a few months ago, and she goes, you won't believe this story. She now just does tiny bits of work. People come out to her house. She lives out in the sticks in the middle of nowhere, and people mm-hmm. come out with usually aggressive dogs, and they had this German shepherd that was very bitey, very not happy at all, and she came out to Turd's house, and Turd had a look at the dog, and, you know, the dog was just so tense and reacting to everything, just totally unhappy, and she could see there was something wrong. And for some reason, she said, I just think this dog is hungry. And she was never a big raw promoter before really talking to me. I can take that, uh, bit, but, you know, it's not like I was the first person to tell her, but I had convinced her over. And she goes, I'm just going to try some real food. So she just made up a raw dog food diet, gave it to the dog. The dog stuffed his face and uh, and lay down and just curled up and went to sleep. And she said the dog went from being out, and the owner was saying, you are like a miracle worker. This dog is, has never relaxed, in, especially in someone else's house. Yeah. And she dog curls up and relaxes. Uh, the owner went off, was giving instructions. She came back the next day, and the dog was completely different. Jumped out of the car, tail at half mast. A helicopter went past. Everything was cool and normal. Runs up to her and says hi. It was like a, she says a complete body transformation in the dog overnight. Said I've never seen anything like it. I thought you might like to hear that, and I'm like, oh, coming from Turbot Rugas, who has all the tricks at her disposal. So I kind of look at that as like trainers certainly me up until very recently would have tried to train some of these issues out of the dogs when actually if the foundation isn't there the dogs can't even take in the lessons you're talking to a kid of ADHD you know he he needs a little bit of support to be able to focus on the lessons so as opposed to supplementing your way out of a bad diet you know I would just be going for a good diet let all that stuff sink in let the good for restore and it will you might throw in some probiotics then at that stage to help that transition but over, over two, three, four weeks, the dog will come back to uh, a proper kind of, he, was, he, won't be, he won't be all zen and relaxed and, you know, but he's, he'll still be the nut job dog that you have. But he'll, <laughs> he'll be better able to focus, you know, it's a fact. Some of it comes with personality, of course, but I think a lot of people misunderstand uh, some of those signals that our dogs are giving us, right? Uh, yeah. Not just the body language, but the stress, the stress poops. I see yeah. that now. Lot. And I'm like, well, yeah. what was going on? Oh, I sent my dog off to board and train for three weeks. And when they came back, he had diarrhea. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> he's yeah. Been moved around for the last couple months. That stress poop is interesting. Do you know when you're walking down the street, Ruby, right? And uh, someone goes, Ruby, and gives you a fright, jumps out from behind a wall, gives you a fright. You clutch your stomach and you go, and you hold your stomach, don't you? You wish you got into the fight or flight kind of stance, you know, like a cool kind of, no, you just have this look of shock and you clutch your guts. And the reason you clutch your guts is because the stress response, uh, cortisol and adrenaline in this case, rushes down to your guts and squishes your guts. All the cap- capillaries and blood vessels are said, no time for digesting. You got to, you've got fight or flight and thinking to right. do. It pushes all the blood to the extremities. Uh, and then your moment of stress is finished and then you walk off and you recuperate from that shock. Okay. But if you're on a chronic stress, like a dog that's been sent off for training by himself for two or three weeks, where's my pack gone? Why is everything so, why is everyone shouting at me all the time? Uh, you get chronic stress all the time. So you, what you get is digestive issues because the, the gut is just not in a place to digest. Can't even eat his food, probably fed poor quality food. But a constricted gut results in squishy soft poos because it can't get the job done. So you start getting soft poos that rush through the digestive system so the gut floor don't get fed because they're looking at it going, oh, I wanted a bit of that. And it right shoots out. Yeah. yeah. So then you get gut flora that's happy to live in that situation, which is the start of your dysbiotic gut. And this is the start of your IBS issues, stress-induced mm-hmm. gut issues that initially didn't have any physical issue. It was all stress-related initially. Does, does it guess. affect that the canine digest- digestive tract is shorter than ours? That probably yeah. has do with well. cool. yeah like well the fact the shape of the dog's digestive tract is everything because they don't have all these dead ends and loops like we have we've got a cecum some herbivores have huge cecums we've a little bit so because we want to hold on to our plant-based meals for as long as we can to give the bacteria time to ferment all the stuff we can't digest ourselves dogs don't have any of that they've just got like you said a smooth pipe poop and the food is just shooting through because it's a carnivore yeah. It eats meat-based diet. That's how we know it eats a meat-based diet. So when you give a plant matter, how much of that does it digest? Not a whole lot. So if you're going to feed plant matter to your dog and you want that to be absorbed in any way, I do recommend plant matter is cooked a little bit or steamed a little bit uh, before you mulch it up and give it to the dog. Because they're not, the only plant matter dogs would really eat in any quantity would be in the intestines of the animal that they're eating. They eat the whole bird, they eat the whole rabbit, probably eat the whole rat, you know, 
they wouldn't they don't tuck into like you know the bellies of cows and sheep and stuff they don't want the, all the grass and stuff that wouldn't be their thing right. but the intestines and the, the fermented foods oh yeah they do eat that stuff so what's your, uh, uh, what's your take on green tripe yeah, I like it. I, I like it. I'm not not rolling around thinking it's amazing, uh, but I think lots of people think it's an amazing elixir for dogs. And I think, oh yeah, I'm sure. Look, it's great. It's cheap. Um, I think um, over here nobody eats tripe. I don't know about in the U.S. Does anybody eat tripe in the U.S.? I wouldn't say. Yeah. Is there... yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. It's very popular in Mexican cuisine. I mean, we're in San Diego, so it's right across no, the border. Okay. Okay, dishes cool. that... But it's clean tripe. It's obviously not green. Yes, and more, more water or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But even for the amount of beef that you guys produce, I can't imagine that uh, even that. Anyway, I'm sure it's still a pretty cheap enough protein. Over here, it's very cheap. So it's the foundation of a lot of raw dog food. So it's it's fantastic. It's great. But I do yeah. have videos of, um, like, I, I would say it's kind of novel to dogs because when you, when the stomach is full of grass, when a dogs bring down sheep and cattle and bigger animals, okay, if they find full animals, they generally pull out the room and they pull out the stomach, the tripe, and they, they leave that there and then they eat everything else off the animal. And they will eat the outsides of that and get the nibble in that. But what they don't want is all the digestive juices and stuff that's in the stomach. But mm -hmm. when you present green tripe to any dog on a plate, my God, they go bananas for it. I don't know what. They just love stinky, stinky stuff. Dogs yeah. are dirty. They love dirty, smelly things. <laughs> smelly, old, smelly old rats. He, my dog rolls in an old rat. He came back to me one day and he had half, he had like a rat leg hanging off his ear. And I was like, oh, oh man. Not good, not good. Yeah, yeah, anyway. we do. We, we get a lot of comments about people not wanting to switch to a fresh food diet simply based on, on the odor alone. And I'm like, they like it. You know, they like it. There's yeah. a reason why they go for it. It's fun yeah. fact, speaking of all the beef that we produce in, uh, in the U.S., there is one particular item that is just driving me nuts because the penises of these cows, these cattle are disappearing. We can't find them here. And finally, someone answered my question. I've been calling around everywhere. Very, very popular item, those pizzles. Yeah. Uh, and they said they're being exported to Asia and other parts of the world because uh, they're known as an aphrodisiac and they put them in soup. Ooh. Yeah. Whoa. So if anyone's wondering why we can't put pizzles on our menu, someone is <laughs> yeah. here. Okay. I would. I can't help but say I'd be disappointed if I ordered tomato soup and there was a penis hanging out. I'd say, whoa, whoa. As much as as much as I think sex is fun, that is uh, that's just a, a bridge too far. Penis soup. I thought that said. I thought you meant peanuts. I thought it was a misspell. But you actually, yeah. I said it. Um, yeah. Look, we get pork pizzle here. We don't get a lot of beef pizzle at all because we just don't. You don't get a lot of male cattle around the place. We don't get. We don't have much of a veal industry, which is what the where all the males go for if they make it. Uh, so we don't get a lot. Of, I didn't. Think so I thought all the pizzle here was pork pizzle, uh, but I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I can't say I've ever bought pizzle. I still feel a little bit squeamish about that one, but most of the time you don't know what you're buying. It's just yeah, a no. I was going to include it in your box, but I was afraid it might get stuck at customs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, who is this guy? Yeah, hairy ears and. and really, uh, anyway, so we're going to yeah. jump into some of your questions, guys. Where this is such a big, big topic, and you know, I'm just intrigued with all these other things that you're bringing up about training and. I know our team put together some questions specific on behavior. Yeah. Um, but before I get into that, I did already see some questions because I think what people are curious about are probiotics, you know, as part of this yeah. conversation. Let's yeah. say, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is we need to include all of these fresh food components uh, to put our dogs ahead, right? Otherwise, yeah. they're just kind of playing catch up. You know, we're not setting them up for success. So we do that. But probiotics is kind of a funny thing. You know, are they still live when they come in pill form? You know, do we want to feed whole foods with probiotics? What what do we want to add into the diet? Um, yeah, so like, it, okay, so this is a good question. And I, let's, let's start at the very start. Okay, so are, are the probiotics live? Y yes, in a way, they are now these days cryogenically frozen so they can really suck out the water out of these things very quickly and so they're preserved okay so pro probiotics these days used to be found in fridges because they were live 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 bacteria in a in a little capsule with a little bit of meal filler that keeps them alive there mm -hmm. and a certain amount of them would get would be alive by the time you take it that's the dream a lot of the probiotics when you tested them back in the day weren't great these days, they sit on a shelf at ambient temperature, which is cool. And as soon as they hit the, the water in your intestines, they they, they go reanimate back to life. So probiotics, great off the shelf, no problem. They are 
frozen in time and they are as much alive as you need to understand. So yeah, they are alive. Um, that's the first thing. So probiotics is, is the live bacteria. The second thing we're after learning is that um, uh, the types of probiotics are interesting. So I definitely, up until last year, was a big supporter of good quality canine probiotics because their gut flora is different to our gut flora, as you can understand, different diet. Um, mm -hmm. But it was highlighted to me by a, prof a professor in, in gut probiotics who said, oh, no, there's no such thing as, as canine, canine probiotics. And I was like, hang on, I'm the canine person. You're the human person. I'll tell you what if this canine probiotics or not. Of course, it's bloody canine probiotics. And, she, and um, she said, well, just show me what's a top brand there. So I sent her a, a, a brand that would be very, very popular in the US and now in Europe. And so I sent her that. And she had a look at it. And she goes, oh, that's the exact same as the stuff in your natural health shop. And I was like, you don't know that. She couldn't. But she goes, just call up the brand that we use here over in Europe that's dominating. It's called BioCult. It's probably a different mm -hmm. name where you are, but let's call it BioCult for the moment. She goes, call it BioCult Bio uh, Gut Health. And I called it up and put up a slide. The, I was just about to name it. A very, very popular probiotic. And the exact same species. I mean, exact same species, but the one for humans has four or five more. So mm. in, I was very disappointed. I thought, but what about all the other cool bacteria that dogs have loads of firmicutase bacterioids? She goes, they're anaerobic bacteria. You can't take them out and put them in an oxygen atmosphere and expect them to be alive. So you can't make probiotics with anaerobic bacteria and dogs have loads of different types of them because they like eating meat. So she said, it turns out that the probiotic industry just puts a picture of a dog in the front of it and markets it very well. Now, yeah. people selling probiotics may disagree with that all they want and I will happily stand corrected. But so far, we've been talking about this for nine months now and it seems to be the same thing. And then more to the point, human probiotics are about a quarter of the cost and probiotics is a numbers game. So if they're a quarter of the cost, you can give twice as much. They're usually more colony forming units per pill. So CFUs, mm -hmm. they call it. They have more than the dog ones. They arrive to your house quicker because the natural health shop is down the road, on and on and on. Many really benefits. And then they have ones for guts and immune system or, you know, BioCult Turbo. I'm, I need to get sponsored by BioCult. So that's the second thing that the canine probiotic stuff, I'm not sure I would be going for that. And um, the third thing is how you give them. So you don't put probiotics on top of the dog's food because you're subjecting those probiotics to the rigors of the dog's digestive system. And when that gets going, the pH is about pH 1, and, and ours is about pH 2, give or take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a tenfold decrease in acidity. It's pure battery acid. So if you put life in on top of that food, it obliterates yeah. it. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a skill you need if you're eating rotten meat and carrying and you know poo so uh you need to have some tricks up your sleeve that you're not going to get contaminated so the, the the acidity is really important so the way you give probiotics is that in between meals so you get yourself a little cup of filtered water no back no chlorine chlorine water if you want the goods to stay healthy imagine having a big nose and a nose that's thousands of times better and you give them chlorinated water to drink no wonder they drink out of rotten puddles you know it's if you had a nose twice as good you wouldn't be able to sleep with your partner. You know what I mean? Imagine thousands of times better. Chlorinated cup of water, rotten. So filtered water or boiled and cooled water and uh, and adding a couple of tablespoons of pro a full fat yogurt, because that's delicious, why not? No sugar, just full fat yogurt in it. You're making your own little yogurt, gut drink, and then you crumple up your tablet and you put that in and that is rocket fuel because that'll get to the stomach. The stomach will say, that's liquid, nothing to do with me, and it'll shoot it through to the intestines and you get lots of troops being released. So it's a, it's a numbers game, and that's how to give them. So yeah. then you're really getting it. Then there's other types of probiotics. Now they're talking about soil probiotics, which are kind of cool. They're yeasts, and you can give them, if your dog's a good infection, and the yeast get in there, and yeast and bacteria hate each other, and they're always just releasing compounds, and like fungi on a plate, keeping the bacteria at bay. So the yeast get in there, and they start releasing compounds. They can kill So the soil probiotics, but that's level two. I wouldn't worry about that. Broad-spectrum probiotics, if your dog has the squits, or after antibiotics or during uh, or any of those stressful situations or older dogs because your gut flora narrows as you get older and um, yeah probiotics are great they're not a they're not an elixir there's not going to be a complete change in your dog from probiotics you're just going through with the guns here and you're trying to reseed the garden so while you're rehabilitating they don't live on forever right it's not like yeah. you they once you feed it it's gone and that's really great information about between meals um i think yeah. a lot of people don't know that but what we tend to see uh are the whole foods that people add into their meals like kefir um yeah. type is another one of them that we see pretty often what are your thoughts on adding those into the meal 
Yeah, I think like we kind of look at human probiotics and prebiotics and think that must be good for dogs because most people in the human world don't understand dogs are even meat eaters. We're still feeding vegetarian kibble virtually to dogs. So yeah. I would say about kefir, initially I fought back a little bit about it and I said kefir is uh, great for humans, you know, but as the probiotic professor was explaining to me um, th that these probiotics in kefir exist there but while they're there they're releasing compounds all the time because they're eating the the yogurt and they're releasing their own compounds so you're getting mm -hmm. their called metabolites and so you get the other benefits the, the reason you house these bacteria and farm them in your guts is because you feed them and they give you stuff like fats and butyrates and all your minerals and, and your vitamins so you're feeding them and farming these things in your guts but in kefir and a yogurt that hasn't been cooked that you've made yourself not pasteurized the bacteria are in there being farmed in the yogurt so you're getting all their cool little little compounds so yes studies show particularly in humans the studies of humans of kefir being used for all sorts of maladies is incredible mood performance for, for sure uh, and the same would be expected in dogs we just don't have the solid science to, to support it but there's the two main bacteria in kefir are lactobacillus and bifido as well and this, there's loads of behavioral studies of, of people using lactobacillus and bifido as antidepressants in dogs and humans and very very effective so probiotics would work and if lactobacillus and bifido are in your kefir i would expect that to work as well so yeah, yeah. why not knock your socks off mm. yeah i'd love i'd be really interested in reading those studies okay let's jump back into to uh, behavior. So this is a good question. And I have a few that were already sent in before our live. How much do you think the gut health affects general anxiety in dogs? Okay, I'd say, I'd say it's a huge amount. I would say there's, there's one or two compounds that we know if you lack, if you decrease in these compounds, you will get more anxious, less able to deal with situations, more reactive, more clingy, all sorts of stuff that we, we know these dogs in our head. Oh, I've met that dog. And those comp compounds are butyrates and GABA. And two studies show that when you change dogs from kibble to raw dog food, the levels of butyrates and GABA in their poo increase, particularly of GABA. And GABA is the one that tells your brain to relax and not be anxious. So they are produced by your gut flora. So if you feed kibble, you can expect much less of those in your dogs because the right bacteria are not there producing them. So what effect do I think uh, gut health has on anxious in anxiety in dogs? Huge. You've got to get the gut health, the gut flora back to firing. They'll give you all your butyrates and GABA and tell your sort to own your good boy, fix your gut, digest properly, get all your vitamins and minerals and proteins and fats that are now being digested properly, whoop up to the brain. So gut health manages all that. And at the heart of that is your gut flora. They're the little fraggles. I don't know if you remember Fraggle Rock, but they're the little things keeping everything going. And uh, yeah, that's it's paramount in anxiety, sorting out that gut first, for sure. Yeah. That's it's kind of scary because I think there are a lot of people that aren't even making this connection between the gut yeah. health and the anxious dogs. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take for behavior to change once gut health has been restored? I'll answer that right. I'll answer the question. But there's a big study of dogs taken out of fighting rings, dog fighting rings, and they mm. all had the same dysbiotic gut and the same pathogenic bacteria. So the same bacterial groups thrived in the stressful situations. So high stress on the dogs. It means constricting that gut, as I told you, because adrenaline and cortisol, terrible thing to live with. It constricts your gut. And the same bacterial floor, the same gut floor resulted. This bacterial floor, this gut pathogenic bacteria that didn't mind living in this high stress situation. And the dogs were came out were anxious and stressed. And people think, well, he's had a hard time. Well, yeah, but he's also got this now shifted gut floor. And so the first step to rehabilitating a dog in such a terrible situation would be fixing the guts. Whereas mm -hmm. your head would be train the dog, give him hugs and you overload him with love. No, he is not able for anything here and he may never get over that. If you get onto chemical preserved food and then bloody medications for all the issues that pop up from a shock gut, he may never get that gut right. So we yeah. see historically issues. Okay, dog fighting rings extreme, but you can have like the, the mother of the pup died in January just recently and eventually she had, she tells me, oh, five months ago, actually her, his mum died and he slept with his mum for 14 years. And I was like, well, there you go. And that sudden jolt of stress, he doesn't get over it or an infection or whatever. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, how long does it take for behavior to change once good health has been restored? I would say it's a very quick process, but it won't be that noticeable because like I said, it's not like a shot of opiates and you're like, oh yeah, this is amazing and you're, you're stoned. You know, it'll be... Yeah it'll be a return to normality you barely notice it but it should be quick like the effects of like um uh, like would be nearly for turret rugas overnight 
although right. she would be very clued into the physical side of things far more mm -hmm. so than most people uh but behaviorally she saw a change overnight in the dog so i would say if the, if it was a dramatically bad i would see a dramatically good improvement if your dog was just a little bit anxious and hyperactive and just eating dry food and would how would he be on raw i would expect a gradual improvement you'll barely notice it but he may settle after dinner as opposed to pacing around the place no more zoomies you know that kind of stuff so right, you know right. gradual i would say I, and i think you know the same goes for us like a lot of what you're talking about are physiological improvements in our in our physical health you know when we don't feel well we're not in a great mood and i think we just yeah. see those wagging tails with our dogs and and don't think that they're capable of like complex emotions and things like yeah. that yeah, they are nice. capable of not feeling well yeah yeah for sure and they just struggle to display it you just think you know very rarely do you see your dog down in the dumps it's just not it doesn't seem to be a feature they have you know but i've seen them anxious i've seen them unable to deal with situations and whatnot and the temptation is to reach for a pill what can we put in to sort this out and mm -hmm. actually it's usually a whole bevy of changes the dog is needed you know um What's this next question? Can many instances of canine aggression be a result of dysbiosis in the gut? For sure, a hundred percent. Same in humans. This is where the human studies, like more, most of the time, a lot of the stuff we know come from the human studies. You've got studies of prison populations uh, taking pre and probiotics, uh, he, he, all sorts of behavioral issues from uh, schizophrenia, which is one of the things they're talking about with probiotics at the moment. They're exploring that. What's the relationship between probiotics and schizophrenia? They know that when you have schizophrenia, you start to gravitate towards the same upset gut flora. And they thought that, well, here we go. We found out the link, what's causing schizophrenia. But mm -hmm. actually now they're thinking that actually it's probably some of the therapies that you're on when you're when you're on some of the drugs the side effects of it it's the side effects of the disease that cause the dysbiosis anyway um can many can aggression result from dysbiosis a hundred percent if you've got an upset gut you're not digesting properly and you're nutritionally starved studies show nutritionally starved dogs are more reactive and it's quite obvious if you are starved of vitamin e or protein and your mate has a bit of protein i'm sorry mm -hmm. particularly if he's not your mate uh, if he's your brother, you'll tolerate it. If he's somebody else, but it depends. So it, it, this is where the whole um, the whole kind of zoo pharmacology, dogs know what they need and what they're missing, and they will they will do what they can to get it. Like a dry-fed dog that doesn't get a raw meaty bone off him, and they yeah. might protect that bone. A raw-fed dog doesn't protect a bone. It's like, like my garden looks like a dinosaur's grave. I don't care about bone. Yeah. yeah, but a dry-fed dog that needs glucosamine and chondroitin, I haven't had any in my diet for seven years, and here is these vital joint-building compounds, mm -hmm. glucagon, glucagon, collagen. I'm eating this bone. Don't try and take it from me, buddy. You know? Yeah, yeah, so, we see that a lot. Well, so what's your take on um, our dogs eating rabbit poop or something, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the coprophagia thing is normal for dogs to do. So rabbits eat, actually eat their own poop. They eat, they do a dark poop first, and then they eat it again, and they do they do a lighter poop because they eat such poor quality forage. But dogs eat poop, different types of poop. They eat cat poop because cats are known to be carnivores. So mm. uh, they give them ever so much slightly more protein. Still give them fifty percent carbohydrates though, even though dark carnivores don't eat carbs. Uh, but so dogs, cats get more protein in their dry food, but it's indigestible protein. It's all crap like. Uh, beet pulp and corn gluten and indigestible yeah. muck but the dog uh just sees this cat poop as a, as a protein thing it's like a it's like a pez dispenser walking down the road and he can eat poop studies show in zimbabwe the village dogs eat about 30 percent human feces from the dumps so they're happy to eat poo they need poo of hindgut fermenters like goats and horses because they reckon there's more vitamin e and k produced on those uh, mm -hmm. so all sorts of poo is on the menu for a dog depending on what he needs but I would see chronic poo eating, particularly if you're around, it does stray into a behavioral issue, particularly if you're around pups reared in a glass box in a pet shop. They get mm -hmm. poo addicts very quickly. They eat their own poo, which is a bit weird. Dogs don't shouldn't be yeah. eating their own poo too often. So that's more of a behavioral issue that's gone wrong there, or she does it around you. But initially, this is an animal that eats poo, is happy to eat poo. But I think it probably wouldn't be their first choice. If you had a sausage and a pile of poo, I'm pretty sure most dogs on the planet would be going for the sausage. You know, they're not they're not dummies. <laughs> this is necessity we're talking about. When you're down to poo eating, it's necessity, surely. Um, <laughs> it's a aggression thing, yeah, dysbiosis in the gut. It's a fact like yeah, do dogs coming out of a ring, uh, like I said, have this dysbiotic gut. And uh, if you're not getting the happy compounds, you're more anxious, you're more likely to react. 
So more aggression will come out of you. It's just the fact you're not able to deal with the situation. You are just, uh, the calming compounds are not there. So you are snappy. Everyone's snappy when they're hungry. Hungry dogs are more reactive, but nutritionally starved is the key bit there, which results in your disposal and everything. So yeah, lots in that, but, but for sure, yes to that, that question, yeah. That's a good question. Here's another one that yeah. I don't, I'm not sure about this. Can you get an accurate reading of serotonin levels with a blood sample? And if yes, oh. be doing routine sampling for aggressive dogs. Oh, that's a gem. The answer to the first question, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I am absolutely sure you can measure serotonin in people's bodies because the whole point of giving and, and modulating how much antidepressants are on, you would like to think is done based on some sort of analysis. Uh, I'm not sure because I've never been on them, but um, I know how those antidepressants work because um, they're called SSRI, uh, SSRI they, they stop serotonin being reabsorbed essentially. That's why those antidepressants work. So when the serotonin in your blood, it hangs around for a bit longer so you don't, it doesn't get reabsorbed and left with none. So uh, I'm sure that you can measure the serotonin levels in the blood. I have never heard it being done in a dog before in my life. So I'm unprepared for the answer to that question, but believe me, I'm going to Google the hell out of it when I'm finished because I hate not knowing the answer to something. So these are good questions. And then if yes, you routine sampling for aggressive dogs, uh, another good question, but look, no, I would see kind of serotonin as a kind of a temporary kind of thing. If your dog was aggressive, I, it would be so multifactorial. Measuring, measuring serotonin would be like, to me, analysis paralysis. It's kind of like if you've got terrible gut issues, you know, the modern vet, I don't mean to be slagging them off because I know they mean well, but I do believe there's quite a lot of industry involved in the, it's the veterinary industry now, somewhat more so than veterinary science, I believe, in some cases. So like, let's say you have a gut issue and, uh, you know, the vet is all rushing around trying to analyze the blood to see what vitamins and minerals you're deficient in. I would say, hang on, this dog has had a chronic gut issue for six months that you haven't fixed. Of mm -hmm. course, his vitamins and minerals are going to be all over the place. And they'll mm -hmm. give him a vitamin K injection and iron will be low and cobalt because you need good flora to digest the foods and give you those compounds. They don't come, you don't just eat, get those compounds yourself. So they will be low, but the solution isn't to run around putting more of these things into your leaky bucket. The solution is to fix the bucket. So when it comes to an aggressive dog, I wouldn't be looking at anything particularly like serotonin wise and stuff in the bloods. I know that giving them a good diet is the first easiest place to start. They, yeah. it, you know, even just the act of just eating food, chewing a bone, you have to lie down, the heart rate decreases. Um, there's opiates in blood uh, that we know in hemoglobin. There's two types of morphine-based compounds that relaxes carnivores and zoos. Mm. So just get all this stuff in, good, good quality fats, just pile it all into this aggressive dog, get them out of that situation. Uh, and then later you might be thinking about the nitty gritty, but I've never heard a routine sampling for aggressive dogs, but I'm going to yeah. Google it to make sure. Yeah. So, well, when you're looking for dysbiosis, that's through the stool sample, I suppose. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But actually, in answer to the probiotics question, probiotics 101, basic level is the, like canine probiotics or the stuff from the local health shop, whatever you believe. Uh, but then there's like, you know, poo pills people are trying to sell. You've got a good yeah. company there in the US called yeah, Animal the, the people Farm. Transplants. Yeah, fecal transplant. So you get poo from a healthy animal. And like people in, in Africa have been doing this for about three, four thousand years. They've got records of it. So we're just coming back around to Western society saying, we've a brilliant idea. What about fecal transplants? So uh, this is a good idea. It does work. And you can get like, you know, you must have an animal that hasn't had antibiotics and a good, clean, good flora. Um, you know, you can just take antibiotics once or twice and pass that on to your kids. It's, it's amazing how long the ramifications of taking antibiotics are not just from the it's, it's actually it's, it's actually lasting for life. But um. Mm. So, yeah, uh, the, the poo pills is one thing. But here's the great thing. So the way the, the poo pills work is that you, you send in a poo sample to animalbiome.com, stick it in the mm -hmm. post, you're not supposed to, but who cares, and uh, gets the animal biome, and they have a look at the poo sample, and they say, whoa, you've loads of clostridia, not a lot of this one, and, yeah, fecal transplant is for you. Another level, again, is called autogenous probiotics, and they're the same price as the fecal transplants, and I think they're probably better. An autogenous mm -hmm. probiotic is where you post off a poo sample and they have a look at it and they say, yeah, it's all over the place because you've got this IBS, IBD, whatever. Uh, and then they culture a probiotic from your own dog's poo. So it's a, so it makes they make the normal good flora and then they post it to you and they mm -hmm. store your dog's good flora in little pillules cryogenically. So every time you've got a problem, it's like 20 bucks and they post you out the dog's profile again. He takes it, boom. So if it's his own bacteria, it's way yes. it really it rehabilitates much quicker so wow. that's, um, that science came from horses racehorse and it came from ireland so this irish group irish equine something 
center, let's say, Irish Echo and Center, I think, they coined this for for really expensive racehorses. And then they thought, you know what, this might work in dogs as well. And it does. But I'd be leaving all that for, you know, in case of glass break emergency or in case of emergency break glass, you know, I don't want to spend 200 bucks on anything. I would try the simple diet first, get the diet right, fix the gut. There's a set process to that. You'll find on my website, dogsfirst.ie, how to rehabilitate, but it's just beginning with broth. And how are you on turkey? How are you on beef? Yeah. How are you on goat? And we give them a month or two on each one and slowly get that gut back up and stop feeding the dog so often. We're feeding the dog way too often. You know, um, eating too much too often is a big problem for it. And if your gut is wrecked, I look at it like a like a car with black smoke belching out the back and you're hitching up a trailer to it twice a day. So if you think of yourself after Christmas dinner and you're like, oh my God, and you just about make it to your chair and you fall asleep and your your body just turns you off after eating the dinner because it takes so much energy to digest and assimilate the meal. But it turns right. out while your body's doing that, it's totally distracted. It's not fighting disease. It's not helping you at all bits and pieces. So people mm-hmm. that do less or rest the gut for 60 and 18 hours a day are actually much fitter and healthier, less inflammation, less cancer, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I eating. think we're just we're so afraid of missing a meal, and we project that onto our dogs. But we no. just wrote an article recently on fasting, and I've tried my you know my own <laughs> uh, yeah. way of fasting, and it, you do it's hard at first, and I think the yeah. truth is that we have our own sort of carb and sugar addictions. But once we get yeah. past that mentally, our body does feel much better. It's a fact. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've got one last question since we're running out of time and I see a lot of people asked about uh, probiotics and dosage, but we fortunately have Karen in here who is answering all of those questions. Um, (laughs) So what was the most dramatic transformation you have witnessed in regard to gut health and canine behavior? Oh, that I have witnessed uh, personally, I am my my answer. Is, I'm very tempted to give Turd Rugas his dog, so it's a secondary one. It's a bit of a cop out, but purely because who's giving it to me? Like a whole mm. life of training dogs, and in her late seventies, she does this simple thing, which is like, wow, maybe that kibble is not actually all it, it's meant to be. And yeah. so I think how, I just think how amazing it must have been for her to go, Jesus. I wonder. I've been doing this for thirty years now, and you know. I wonder how much else I could have done by changing the diet. I can't help but think because those things would have come to me. Like when Karen Becker kind of found out that um that that you know neutering the dogs was actually not a good idea to do that early and she has to do another video and come on and she's crying and it's mm-hmm. legit, you know, there's it is yeah. legit. Some people can fake that stuff, but not her. And she goes, I can't believe the amount of dogs I might have harmed by neutering them at six months. Just be right. you know, it was the wrong thing to do for their health for sure. Uh, and so uh, I, I kind of think well, we all have those moments. And I think when Turbs gave me that story, I kind of felt that way. I kind of thought, wow, this really is that transformative. But it's not like I've had been able to run these tests. Like I've been in guide dogs. I've had populations of dogs and I've been adding in bits and pieces. But it's not like I ever jumped a, a, a group of guide dogs from dry to raw because you're not permitted to mess around their diets like that too much. So all my information now is secondary. And except for the, the, we're stu- I'm studying for this, essentially this part of the book that I had to leave out, the book is an absolute monster. But the bit on behavior started sucking me in because probiotics is just this immense field. It's just so interesting. And behavior, nobody's talking about it. There's no studies, very little studies on like, um, there's no studies on the effect of dry food on behavior, not one. So when they test dry food on animals, they test four blood readings, six, mm-hmm. six out of the eight dogs have to make it to the end of the trial and they do four blood readings and then they go okay that's fine the dog could yeah. be bashed right head off the wall wouldn't matter a damn so <laughs> chemicals in pet food are not there are not assessed based on the effects on behavior so even that alone is like bloody hell so you have to do circumstantial stuff what happens when we put in blueberries like we know we can slow cognitive decline in old dogs by adding in a bit of blueberries a bit of apple a bit of blueberries a bit of carrot a bit of dark greens couple of other things okay so there's loads of these cool little behavioral studies that exist that dry food companies have hijacked and said wow if you add them in it slows cognitive decline and so they take that information and they they put the one percent blueberry one percent whatever into their into their dry food and then they slap a big fancy scientific label on it and say this is for older dogs to slow cognitive decline and you pay four times more at the till for it 
So there's loads of those studies out there, and then there's the whole scourge of the of what doesn't work. There's a whole other book on on I'm going to call it feeding feeding behavior. But um, so yeah, my, you know, my, yeah. Well, no, geez, I hope not. I hope not. I'm doing a seminar <laughs> on it, and it's about three hours long. So there's nothing that dramatic that I've seen firsthand, but all the stuff added up from everybody else is just incredible. I stopped training like 10 years ago when I, you know, you meet some really good trainers and you realize, ah, you know what, I'm probably better at something else. So I haven't been working with aggressive dogs at all. So it's, it's outside my field. But if I was going to do the book, I would be straight to any behaviors feeding fresh food or behaviors that aren't feeding fresh food. And can I feed fresh food to your dogs? Have you got like, you know, dogs rescued from fights and stuff? That's the side that's where you mm. need Oh, yeah. No, you, you really uh, piqued my interest with that about the, the dogs that came from fighting groups. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. And humans then, uh, that would just send me down to what effect, what does the biome look, look like after humans have had a fight? We know mm -hmm. that uh, the biome of troops, US troops, there's great studies on them, on uh, IBS issues, but dysbiosis in, uh, in troops coming back because it's just pure shock and horror, uh, crap food, uh, yeah, yeah. more moments of, of boredom eating the wrong food and then intense stress, and then PTSD uh, mm -hmm. has terrible effects on gut flora, and it's cyclic. So your gut flora is going to aggravate your PTSD because you're less able to deal with a situation, which makes you more prone to PTSD, which means more stress, which means more good issues, which means less good gut flora, which means more stress, more PTSD, and so yeah. on. So that was done on American troops, two big studies. So th those sort of studies are floating around my head all the time. I'm thinking, oh my God, there's so no, much. You know, it's, it's interesting, but I need to speak to a couple of human people first and get back into the behavior side of things. Uh, yeah. that's, that's 2023 maybe, you know? All right. Well, I hope so. And I hope you make your way here to San Diego at some point. Oh, definitely. The U.S. <laughs> next year, I'm going to, I'm, in, I'm doing a talk in Albany in New York next year, some sort of pet summit with uh, yeah. Larry uh, Colger. Um, so, yeah, Colger, um, yeah. yeah so I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And there's something else I do. And San Diego, as I say to you all the time, that's, I was West Coast for my, for my honeymoon. I'm dying to get back there. Love mm -hmm. the place. So uh, yeah, for sure. I'll be there getting free yes. feet. Yeah. We would love to have you. Thank you so much for joining. If you guys don't already have a, a copy of this, it is, it's a lot, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Thanks very much. So much for joining us. All right, guys. Good. Take care. See you later.